All right. <laughs> And, and let me just thank a couple of folks. First of all, I want to thank my colleagues for coming to San Francisco in this important discussion. You are looking at the choir. Uh, Roger Hernandez, who is the chair of labor, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, who's the chair of this committee, but also, as I think folks know, has been a statewide labor leader, Assembly Member Rob Bonta, who's the chair of the health committee, uh, Phil Ting. Uh, we are all part of the assembly members that support this bill, but we are not yet at a majority. And this is why I need to thank um, not just all the tremendous advocates who we worked with, but I have to thank the workers and your voices. We are going to need your voices, the Sandra Herreras of the world and the Samantha Adams, and multiply you by thousands. We need your voices in the coming months to move this forward. And then also I want to thank our businesses who are here. I know there are representatives of business here. Jen, thank you for representing the many businesses that are doing the right thing. Um, your voice is so incredibly important as well because uh, there are many businesses uh, that are fearful about what this might mean and haven't understood that this is good for business. This is good for worker, not just worker uh, productivity, uh, but it's good for the bottom lines of businesses when you have uh, folks uh, who are able to work with predictive scheduling and fair scheduling. So I just want to thank everyone for being part of what is a movement, and it is my hope that California will soon be the first state in the country uh, to really move on fair scheduling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you tell me more about how the, f the flexible scheduling and, and predictive scheduling works out? And it, it sounds like it's all done between and among the workers themselves. Yes, I established um, when we hire someone, they have set schedules. And then the employees can determine for themselves if they need to cover a shift during the week, which doesn't happen that often because they know their schedule. And they've known it for most 50% of my staff have been with me for over a decade. So wow. they've known their schedule forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They schedule doctor appointments on Tuesday, Thursdays. They schedule their classes for Monday, Wednesday, Friday evenings. You know, they, they have a plan already. But in the event that they're going on vacation or there's a concert they want to see or whatever it might be, then they have the ability to just ask other people to pick it up mm -hmm. and they work it out amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. But you don't, you don't do any last minute changes? With, I never do any weeks. last minute changes that aren't related to sick. Sick outs is the, big, is the problem, like somebody's ill we do have one on-call server per shift, and that server is responsible until 9 a.m. that day. So that's just called in if someone's sick. And then even if someone's sick, I never call the on-call right away. I always text them and say, warning, sick server. And then I send out a message to the other 12 possibilities and say, does anyone want to pick up this shift? And the on-calls get called in about two or three times a year. And they're very, they're, they've been great about it. That was their idea, actually, because it used to be whenever anyone was sick, I would send out this desperate pleading text <laughs> six or eight times in a row. And then individual ones, I know you see this. I know you see this. I see your little dots moving. <laughs> and they would all be, God. And, you know, until I could guilt somebody into it. And it was terrible for me and for them. So they came to me and were like, listen, Patrona, can we do something where, you know, I know on Tuesdays if someone's sick, I'll have to work on Tuesday, but that Saturday when I'm hanging out with my family, I'm not going to be getting, you know, six or eight texts from you being like, please, God, don't make me wait tables. The customers are going to leave us, you know. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so they suggested this, and it's worked out really well for us. I know that part of the bill that we're looking at now involves payment for on-call mm -hmm. um, shifts, which I think would be hard on my business to do, I assumed, four hours. Mm -hmm. Four hours would be a little bit tough. Um, and we would probably have to rearrange it somehow, like make somebody on call for, I, I don't know how we would do it. But anyway, it would depend on what the bill came out. But ultimately, it's the sky is falling thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, every business is going to say, oh my god, that's going to be terrible. Oh, we'll work it out. 50 cents more for a burger. This would also be directed to, to Jen. Uh, and, but thank you to all the panelists for your contributions here today. They're very helpful. Uh, Jen, you, you mentioned something about incentivizing or creating incentives for employers that are doing the right thing. I've often kind of thought in my, in my mind, how do we de disincentivize employers that are cheating workers, uh, whether it's proper hours or wages, or you noted that we make it easier for folks to just keep a greater number of part-time workers. So my, 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 my ask or my inquiry with you would be, 
what are some of some of the models that you think would work to encourage people to do it the way you're doing it? To, yeah. To, to, to see, to, to encourage in the minds of employers, there's a lot of benefits for me going this way uh, because the outcomes are good for both parties. So can you give yeah. us a couple of examples? Absolutely. For instance, there's a San Francisco payroll tax where I pay a certain number, a certain percentage of my payroll to the city. And, you know, maybe that could be less for full-time employees and more for part-time. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you pay 2% for part-time employees and 1% for full-time. Um, although I know that's going to gross receipts, but anyway. Um, one of the other things is I used to get a tax credit this is federal, but I used to get 25% of the money that I spent on my employees' health insurance back because I provided full, mm -hmm. because I paid for full benefits for all my part-time employees from the federal government. But apparently there's a cap on that where if your average employee makes over 50000 a year, you no longer get that. Last year we made $50,024 a year, so I lost $30,000 tax credit. Oh, wow. Why punish people for paying their employees more? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't punish, you shouldn't say because, well, you gave everyone a raise this year, so you're no longer going to get that tax credit again. It's not encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, ways to push people toward full time is to give benefits like that. Um, a lot of restaurants want to offer their employees health care. I always say there's a huge difference between offering employees health care and doing what I do, which is giving employees health care. Mm -hmm. um, so many of my staff are young and immortal. They wouldn't take health care if I mm -hmm. offered it to them. <laughs> you know, if I said, I'm going to pay 50%, they'll be like, ooh, no, I don't want to pay for that. <laughs> you know? right. so, mm -hmm. so I do give it to them. But there should, you know, I would love to see the city participate in some sort of a tax credit like, this, like right. the country did, you know, for 50000 and below, apparently. Um, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I spend $118,000 a year on health insurance. Yeah. And maybe if restaurateurs knew that they were going to get a break on their city taxes or on you know some portion of it but mm. who knows come to this as a worker advocate and it dawned on me my daughter did uh is a server now that this idea of picking up extra hours at the end this is going to um it unfortunately have the effect with some workers who would like to pick up you know, four hours at the end of their shift or pick up an extra shift of not being able to because of the scheduling. Is that real? Um, is that something that's going to be addressed? The the opportunity for more work uh, if offered voluntarily at the last minute? So right now, the ordinance as drafted requires that when additional hours become available, the employer offer those additional hours to all existing part-time employees, provided that those existing part-time employees are qualified to do the work that has become available. Um, you know, just to, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, that, that uh, wh while that is great in theory and uh, even in language, it still is very broad, so how does that actually play out in practice? Um, we are still working on the rules I mean that will implement um, the details of how that how that plays out but but that is really the whole thrust of that first part of the ordinance so I think um, I don't see the two as being in conflict I think the point is that the existing part-timers have access to those hours I mean that's sort of the the purpose right. of the legislation mm -hmm. um, and and you know right now or I should say pre-ordinance that hasn't existed so um, you know, we do think that there is a way to to um, come up with a framework in which that will be possible, but but it's really giving the part timers the initial access to those hours. Right. What about unscheduled overtime? Mm -hmm. So the yeah. So the ordinance does um, the ordinance does carve out an overtime exception, meaning that the employer is only required to offer additional hours up to thirty five hours per week. Okay. Okay. So not right. So that would not kick overtime. Then. We are going to take public comment um, for anyone who would like to by just coming up to the table uh, for one minute to state your name, affiliation, and uh, your bearing on today's hearing topic. If there's some information that you'd like to give us or you feel like was not heard, um, we'd be happy to schedule time to do that and to take any written information. Uh, just asking a couple questions. Uh, there's two different things going on, very similar but somewhat different, which is your bill, the state bill, and then San Francisco's mm -hmm. um, version or uh, legislation. And they're a little different I, the way I see it. I think uh, Ms. Patel mentioned that they're still working through final draft. 
But with regards to uh, your bill, the state's bill, is there any exceptions? I haven't read it all, so excuse me. But broad, uh, broadly speaking, is there any exceptions for employers who cannot comply? And if not, why not? Because there's got to be, and I can think of one at least, but uh, one group of employers that simply can't comply. And I'm wondering what your thoughts Just are Just out of curiosity, that. who? That would be the theater owners. Um, Movie theater owners. Oh, movie theater. So if you go to see a movie, and I have my staff, you know, I'm management, mm. and I have my part-time people that are working at the theater, I don't know uh, how many people I need for a certain date because I don't know which movie I'm getting from the distributors who are separately in business. You know, and they're not in business with me, but uh, they provide me with my content, my films. So when I get those, uh, when I get, when I find out from the distributor what films are coming, it's only about two days lead time. <laughs> so it, it's difficult because I could get the Star Wars film that's coming up, and I'd need a really robust staff, or I could get a film that is under the radar and nobody goes to it, and I find myself, you know, uh, overstaffed or understaffed, depending on the case. So. I'm pro probably there are other cases as well, but that's right. what I know. I would suggest and encourage you to uh, write your concerns and get it to um, to Mr. Chu's office or to go talk to his staffer about it as well as we continue to work on this. Thank you. I'll do that. I appreciate it. And one quick follow-up question. Can an employer initiate a request to an employee or group of employees, and it's a request, it's not a requirement? Uh, whether right. they want to leave or take more hours on. Um, and I think for San Francisco, we probably, SEMA could probably answer that question. Maybe you can meet with her. AB 357, the, the state bill that you were referring to, um, does not affect small businesses or small franchises. It's geared towards large. large businesses, large food and retail businesses with both 500 or more employees in California and 10 or more locations in the United States. So I'm not sure if the theater you're referring to meets that standard or not. If it doesn't, it's not contemplated or covered by this bill. And then one of the exemptions also in the bill is that when an employee voluntarily trades shifts with another employee or requests from the, the, the business a change in his or her shift, when it's driven by the employee, that's an exemption and there's no penalty yeah. there. So I'm not sure how if there's a sort of voluntary employer-driven mm -hmm. option and then an employee says, yes, I want to take advantage of that, how that would fit. So um, thanks for your questions. I'm Dee Dee Workman. I'm with the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce represents many different sorts of employers, uh, large and small employers, local, national employers, um, uh, very different industries, a very di diverse group of industries. And so we have concerns about a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. mandate that would sort of have a blanket um, determination of how businesses are supposed to function in terms of scheduling, predictive scheduling, because as you heard from Mr. Moscone, um, it really depends. It depends on the industry. It depends on a lot of different variables. Um, we're afraid that one sort of set, uh, uh, a set of regulations that's the same for everyone can end up being a disincentive for employers to be able to be flexible for employees who want that flexibility. I think this conversation that just happened here at the end is really key. Um, some employers want to be able to say to an employee, hey, things are really slow. We'd like, is anybody, anybody want to go home? Or, or, oh, wow, we're just getting suddenly this rush of people. Anybody want to stay? The way the San Francisco ordinance is written now, I can tell you, is that to do that, if the, if the employer does that, then they would have to pay predictability pay. Mm -hmm. So it's a disincentive. We'd like to find a way to have employers and employees be able to communicate with each other openly about this without employees feeling like they're being coerced or being forced into changing a schedule they don't want to change. But giving the employers the flexibility and the ability to serve their customers uh, in a way you know that works for for everyone, um, they are working out the the San Francisco ordinance right now. It was you know it went into effect in July, but it's not being enforced three months later or whatever it is because it's so mm -hmm. difficult to work out these kinds of details. Mm -hmm. um, it's really very difficult. It really does turn on the individual words. 
Uh, it's really very confusing and kind of chaotic right now. So we would just really urge you, at, if you're going to pursue this at the state level, to really work with employers and work with individual industries to be able to um, come up with policies that, that, you know, that work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak today. My name is Chris Wright. I'm the Executive Director of the Committee on Jobs. The Committee on Jobs is an association of some of the city's larger employers. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to promote, to promote a business climate that allows San Francisco to remain a good place to live, work, and to do business. Uh, we, among others, have uh, front, rows, front row seats to the implementation of this scheduling policy in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I would ask uh, that you all, before moving forward with the one-size-fits-all sort of scheduling policy, uh, that you carefully look and see how things end up here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. to give it some more time, um, to see how it actually works for employees, businesses, and customers. Um, as you've heard, San Francisco's uh, law has created some confusion for those that are required to implement the law uh, and are trying to determine how, it, uh, how it's going to work. The law went into effect just a few months ago, and we're still in the rulemaking process, as mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Patel mentioned earlier, and things still need to be sorted out, I believe. Ultimately, restrictive scheduling will likely force employers to be unable to accommodate employee requests for last-minute scheduling changes or pick up additional work uh, for their if their schedule permits, as they've done before. So that is a potential problem. The policy also creates significant confusion and record-keeping challenges for employers to follow uh, to see uh, when and where the law actually applies. So I understand that uh, their scheduling policy may sound good on paper. Um, I think we still need to see how it's actually implemented here and its impacts, again, both on employees, employers, and customers. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. I like Miss Squire. <laughs> and I would just like to give uh, kudos to Jen and employers like her, and I'm glad I spoke after those two employers right now because I have two children who are college age who are working uh, in retail. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just start by s uh, this morning I asked my daughter. Um, she used to work at Nordstrom Rack, and that was before the ordinance passed in San Francisco, and I said, how was that? And she said, I didn't have a life. And she had a job <laughs> during the summer break. Mm -hmm. And you know, kids have like, they want to party, they want to meet with their friends, and she said, I didn't have a life. Think of that as a mother with a young child, mm -hmm. and just like a slave to her work. But uh, I also have a son, and 18 months ago, he worked at the Giants dugout. That was his first job, and I was really proud. And then it got to him, because sometimes they would work up to 1 a.m. when the game had overtime. And so he left the job because it was too much. And he thought he would get a better deal at Target. Same thing. He, he, was, um, he was enrolled in, in junior college. And his schedule just didn't match his school schedule. And so he had to quit college. I wish he, he quit the job. But he, he, he kind of liked having money. And I, Samantha mentioned that. And I totally said yes. Um, he suddenly had that pocket money for himself. But he also um, was able to... Um, help at home because I, I work part-time myself. So as a community organizer for Parent Voices, I also hear stories about mothers. So one of our mothers, Danielle, used to work at one of the groceries, and she has a four-month-old. And sometimes she had to work a 4 p.m. to 12 p.m. shift, but sometimes she would be called to, to work in the morning. And she left the job now, but that's so unpredictable. Imagine having to suddenly call your child care provider and say, I couldn't come today. And when she's called, and there's just no, child care doesn't work that way. And so I think that this is very good policy. And mm -hmm. when our employers who are here or Chamber of Commerce said, we have to talk about exemptions. We have to be careful about making the exemptions be the rule. Mm -hmm. and, and overriding the intent of the law. Mm -hmm. I think that we have heard from Chen said that it works. My daughter now works at American Apparel. She used, started working in San Francisco before the ordinance passed, but then she went to San Jose State. When San Francisco passed the ordinance and American Apparel did the two-week scheduling, American Apparel and San Jose also did that. Mm -hmm. So it's a less, I mean, it's like employers see the benefit in predictable work scheduling. 
and about like the last minute changes. So sometimes my daughter would uh, have a, a midterm, and so she would talk to her coworker, which would be able to cover for me. Mm -hmm. They do that, and I think as of now, um, it doesn't really change the. I don't think that the other worker who covers for her shift, and that could be a good exception. I don't think that the worker complains that they have to pay her a time and a half. I don't think they do that yet. But we don't know what's going to happen with that. But I think those are exceptions that we should be aware that they should not become the rule. Uh, and and I think that this is good policy okay. when our workers yeah. are, are, are doing well and, and when our students can go to school. By the way, I just remembered my daughter actually left her Nordstrom job before because she had a midterm. and. Uh, they couldn't find a replacement for her, and so she had to quit the job. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank the chairwoman again for putting on this wonderful panel and, and for all my colleagues who participated in today's hearing, and most of all to all of our panelists. Thank you for all your input today and to everyone who came to, to attend and, and be part of this hearing. I, I really feel and am inspired by the strength of a growing coalition and movement as we move forward. And like on many things, um, the state of California is, is once again on, on the cutting edge. San Francisco usually precedes us, but uh, the state of California is, is on the leading edge, and, and that's where I like to be. That's where we should be. That's where we should be fighting. And, you know, as we, you know, we talked about the fact that up here we're, we're sort of the choir, uh, we do have colleagues who see this issue a little differently, so I think it's going to be important as we move forward to continue to build the business case for um, uh, predictive scheduling and, and fair scheduling, you know, we, to get our employers who are doing it come and testify and share how it's good for worker retention and worker productivity, to get data from, you know, Starbucks and other businesses that are doing this now, to get data from uh, San Francisco and other cities and states that may implement and just kind of uh, build the evidence because in the absence of that, there's often this kind of the sky is falling, the world's going to end uh, approach and, and I think it's better if we don't have to guess. We can tell you what happens. And um, so I, th I think that'll be an important sort of strategic point on AB 357 going forward. And then I just want to thank the chairwoman again for having this hearing in as part of the select committee on, on women in the workplace. As, as a father of two amazing daughters, one who's 16 and one who's 10, um, and someone who wants to see them achieve their dreams and have opportunity and fairness in whatever they do, it, um, uh, it's, it's really meaningful to me to be able to be on this committee as we shape a world that tries to remove this disparate impact on, on women and provide more opportunity and more fairness. So thank you for the opportunity to do that with you, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Gonzalez. Uh, we know that in California we are facing a time where, uh, particularly in this post-recession era, where we continue seeing a broadening of the spectrum in the workplace, and that broadening has not been uh, for the better. It's been for the worse. Uh, there are, uh, like there is a spectrum throughout our state on so many different fronts. In the workplace, uh, we see that there are employers that are just very conscientious who care, and then we see on the other end of the spectrum, employers that take more of an exploitive approach of workers. And uh, unfortunately, because of that, we see that there are a growing number, percentage in our state of workers that are finding themselves part-time workers who don't want to be part-time. And, uh, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. That has happened all We've seen those numbers rising in the last seven, eight years. It's consistent with this post-recession uh, era. But uh, what's critical is that we're also seeing folks that have gone back to work uh, that are making less money than they did prior to the recession. So it's tougher. And because of that, the dynamic of the workplace is different. Women, in particular, are having to find themselves doing more than one job to find sustainability. And when our working mothers are, are, the, are the majority of working women, uh, in low wage work, it's extremely concerning uh, that uh, we're finding a dynamic that really puts women in the workplace uh, in a second class um, tier that should not exist. And when none of us as community leaders should allow this to, to continue, we need to continue curbing. That's why this, this curbing that kind of a growing, I call it a cancer, an epidemic uh, in, in California's economy. So that's why I'm very enthused that I've uh, tremendous colleagues uh, like Chairwoman Gonzalez and uh, Chairman Bonta who care, uh, who are vocal, uh, and who want us to empower the rest of the legislature to know what's being discussed here. Um, yes, uh, the, the workplace is changing, but, but that affects the households. And I, I think uh, our, our, our uh, panelists, uh, was it Sandra? 
uh, Sandra said it well when she said that the employers, some employers aren't looking at them, are looking at workers as workers, but it, I think I'd like to add a, uh, to that. Not looking at workers and that our workers are people, are members of families and that mm -hmm. they have these greater challenges because of the conditions and how these conditions have changed in an adverse way. Uh, so we have to look at the totality and we have to understand that uh, as folks expect government to be flexible, um, then governments ought to also expect uh, the business community to be flexible. If these are the new realities of these tougher ways of doing business uh, that make it tougher for the worker to live, then we need to make sure that uh, we have to have the flexibility to change um, the scheduling practices. Mm -hmm. uh, that if we are asking a worker to do two, three jobs to keep afloat, I don't think that's the way to go. But if that is a new reality, then there's got to be flexibility in all that uh, consists of child care, planning for doctor visits, and, and, and providing the necessary, not the desired, but the necessary flexibility to make it work in this tougher env uh, uh, employment world. So uh, I thank you, Chair, for your vision here and your focus here, and I'm confident that uh, through your diligence, we're going to be able to you know, get this uh, piece of legislation on this issue across the finish line. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of it. This is particularly important to me. Uh, you know, I wanted to, to deal with some of these issues with the Select Committee on Women in the Workplace because every time we talk about workplace issues, as a former labor leader, I'll tell you, uh, nothing matters more to me. Um, but what we often talk about in terms of workers and how hard things are, um, that's true. And then magnify that to be a, a worker who also has to care for other people. I'm the daughter of a single mom. I'm a single mom myself. And um, realizing in particular when we, when we drill down to um, who these workers are so often um, that this disparate impact becomes even larger. And it, it, it affects everything from that worker's life. Um, you know, forget about work-life balance. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about whether or not we can raise happy and healthy children who, who have a shot in life. And so um, we're going to continue to look at these issues uh, and, and ensure, hopefully, that we get it right um, and that we remain a leader in California on ensuring that um, all workers, but in particular uh, women workers, have a fair shot in the workplace, especially in low-wage work. So thank you for coming out today, and um, we're going to continue this conversation. And I really encourage, especially the business folks who spoke, I don't know if they're still here, um, or the organizations, and, and we've seen this with other legislation, please come and talk to us beforehand. I mean, I think so often in Sacramento as we're developing and pushing legislation, what happens is there's this culture of just opposing things, you know. And at the, the end of the day, we get a bill signed, and they say, well, wait, this doesn't work for the 15 reasons. Well, those 15 reasons could have been addressed in the initial legislation legislation often if we have those discussions and then we don't put someone like SEMA in a spot to try to make rules to <laughs> things that sometimes even contradict each other and and you know if we're writing the legislation we may not see it but when we have that input early and sometimes the answer is going to be no I'm sorry you know <laughs> there <laughs> we're writing it we're, we're those of us on this panel are definitely um, coming from a certain perspective so sometimes the answer is going to be no but sometimes um, we, we can adjust. We're not trying to kill business. We just want businesses to be um, responsible. And I think that uh, we, there can be a coalition. And we saw a business owner today just lay it out of why this can work. So um, thank you all for coming. If you want more information on this or other select committee uh, hearings, please uh, leave your, your name and, and address or email, uh, even better, or a card so that we can contact you. And uh, this is officially adjourned.